and they can get back to their lives. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Just have the attention of uh, members before we go to committee membership and, uh, and other matters. <coughs> I just have a, uh, a statement to make. As members will be aware, on Monday the Manager of Opposition Business raised as a matter of privilege whether the member for Pearce had failed to comply with the resolution of the House regarding the registration of members' interests such as would constitute a contempt of the House. I'm satisfied that the Manager of Opposition Business has raised the matter at the earliest opportunity. The Manager of Opposition Business tabled a number of related documents, and I have examined these as well as his statement to the House. The matter arises from an alteration made by the member for Pearce to his statement of interests on 13 September of 2021. As recorded in the Register of Members' Interest, this alteration addresses payments related to a defamation case in the court. In the alteration, the member, for, the member lists, quote, part contribution to the payment of my fees by a blind trust known as the Legal Services Trust. As a potential beneficiary, I have no access to information about the conduct and funding of the trust. The manager of opposition business claims that by not including detail as to the source of the donated funds in his statement of interest, the member for Pearce has deliberately evaded the purpose of the register. I also note that while the member for Pearce made a public statement on 19 September about obtaining information from the trustee of the Legal Services Trust, that information did not include detail as to the source of the donated funds. The House has several rules about the pecuniary interests of members in standing orders and the resolution for the registration of members' interests. In 1986, the House provided that certain behaviours in relation to registration of members' interests would be included as a category of contempt of the House. Since the passage of the Parliamentary Privileges Act in 1987, section 4 of that Act provides the test which applies to consideration of all contempts. The registration of members' interests is in its nature a disclosure regime, and transparency is a key feature. All members of this House would be familiar with their obligations in relating in relation to completing and maintaining a statement of registrable interests, and the fact that these obligations require them to exercise their judgment about the disclosures. The explanatory notes published by the Committee of Privileges and Members' Interests state, and I quote, the purpose of the statement of registrable interests form is to place on the public record members' interests which may conflict or may be seen to conflict with their public duty. The notes also state as guidance, no form can cover all possible circumstances and members should consequently bear in mind the purpose and spirit of the return in deciding which matters should be registered. Based on my careful consideration of all of the information available to me, I am satisfied that a prima facie case has been made out and I'm willing to give precedence to a motion concerning privilege or contempt as raised by the Manager of Opposition Business, referring the matter to the Committee of Privileges and Members' Interests. As members would also be aware, and as House of Representatives practice makes clear, an opinion by the Speaker that a prima facie case has been made out does not imply a conclusion that a breach of privilege or contempt has occurred. In giving precedence for a motion to be moved, I am simply allowing the House the opportunity to consider a motion immediately and debate and decide on whether the matter should be referred to the Committee for Inquiry and Report. And I now call the Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I move that the following matter be referred to the Committee of Privileges 
and members' interests. One, whether the conduct of the member for Pearce by refusing to disclose on the register of members' interests the identities of individual donors to a trust used to pay his private legal fees has failed to properly register an interest where a conflict of interest with his public duties could foreseeably arise or be seen to arise, and in doing so created a precedent which threatens the integrity of the register of members' interests. Two, whether the member for Pearce has knowingly provided false or misleading information to the register, registrar of members' interests. Three, whether this constitutes a contempt of the House. And four, whether paragraph 2K of the House resolution on the registration of members' interests requires members to provide reasonable identifying details of the sources of gifts that meet the relevant thresholds. Mr Speaker, if I can start by thanking you for considering the matters that I raised and thank you for, in weighing those issues up, making the decision to grant precedence. Uh, had you not done so, I'd be in a position of moving, having to move a suspension of standing orders instead of us being able to put it to this House. I note that for the entire time of your speakership, there have not been many occasions where privileges references have been made, but in every instance when you have decided to not give precedence, the House has accepted that and no suspension has been moved. And where you have given precedence, the House has then resolved to send the matter to the Privileges Committee. And I urge the House to do exactly that today. In doing so, the House is not making a decision, and I am not <coughs> wanting members opposite to feel that they are being asked to adjudicate on the member for Pearce himself. But they are in a situation where the Speaker, elected unopposed, has said that there is a prima facie case here. And the resolution allows the Committee of Privileges to examine the merits of this. Now, what they would be examining is no small matter. We have here not the sort of blind trust that members have used previously. There have been a number of times where members have come to this parliament having already in their lives amassed considerable wealth. Good on them. No problem with that. And they want to make sure they avoid conflicts of interest, so therefore they put their money into a trust. And, they have, and someone else handles where the investments go. And up until now, that has been what we have dealt with in the register when we have dealt with a blind trust. The member may not have known where the money was being invested, but we knew exactly whose money it was. On this occasion, we are dealing with something that, if it is allowed to stand, if you are allowed to do this, we may as well not have a register of members' interests at all. Like the term blind trust is being used. This is a brown paper bag stitched together by lawyers. We have no idea whose money is involved. If we accept what the member for Pearce has said publicly, we know the first thing. He can find out where the money has come from because he was able to say it's not foreign donors and it's no one on the lobbyist register. So he has made clear that he can find out whose money this is, is in this trust, for which he has personally benefited for a personal bill. So he can find out who it is, and he has chosen not to. And in choosing not to, he wants us to allow a situation to stand where the register of members' interests does not allow the public to know who gives us money. Now think about it. Think about the purpose of having a register. The whole reason it's there is so the public know if a member of parliament gets money, the public have a right to know where that money has come from. What the member for Pearce has done and there is a prima facie case of this, and the, the Privileges Committee will get the chance to examine it if this is carried, 
what the member of for Pearce has done is something that no one else in this House has tried on. Since Federation. Since Federation, no member of parliament has tried this. That you can receive income and not let anyone know who was paying. Now, the concept that he has no idea, I've got to say I have difficulty with, to think that there are philanthropists out there who could fund any charity in the world. And they look around for the different funds at a time of a pandemic, there's plenty of need out there, and they say, well, of all the different causes, the one I want to give money to is the legal bills of the member for Pearce, but I don't want him to know that I ever gave a cent. And somehow I've found out that this secret trust exists. Now, we're meant to believe that if we're to believe that the member for Pearce has no idea at all. But just start with this simple principle. Why do we have a register? Now, if you don't believe in having a register of members' interests, vote against this. I get that. If you don't believe members of parliament should be held to any standards, vote against this. But if you believe that the public have a right to know where money comes from if it comes to us, then allow the Privileges Committee to examine it. I don't know what they will find. There have been a number of times when precedence has been granted and I thought, yep, we've got there and it's come back without an answer that I thought was great. But that's their job. And as a parliament, we've appointed people to the Privileges Committee to do that job. And sometimes, regardless of party affiliation, those members on that Privileges Committee have taken their job seriously, have taken their integrity of that role seriously, and have voted contrary to what might otherwise be considered party lines. The classic example of that would be Bruce Bilson. The classic example, where I made the reference, precedence was given, it went through unopposed, and we ended up with a unanimous decision coming back from the Privileges Committee, and then the resolution was carried unanimously through the House. That's how matters of integrity should be dealt with. And that's what this House is now being asked to consider again. If we're not going to refer the member for Pearce, Think about what's then allowed. Any member of this House can then set up a blind trust and have whatever income they want go into it, receive the money, and all they have to say is, I got it from the trust. I don't, know who. don't know where the money came from. Now, if we start with a principle that disclosure is there to avoid corruption, that the disclosure, the register is there to avoid corruption, that we want to avoid conflicts of interest to avoid corruption, then we need to oppose a system where members of parliament can keep secret who is giving them money for personal bills. Now, if you wonder whether is this just a Labor issue, Remember the extent to which those opposite railed against a Labor senator who disclosed where he had money come from because it was to pay for a personal bill and because of the source of where that money had come from. He He's no longer a member of parliament and left because of that. Now, if you think that was a reasonable prosecution of the facts right now, the member for Pearce is wanting to create a situation where those facts would never be known, where anyone can just set up a trust and it doesn't matter what, what business interest, what potential criminal interest, what potential overseas interest gives you money, all you have to report is I got the money from the trust. Now, no one has ever tried this before, not because no one had cause to possibly think of it, I'm, probably some people had, but everyone just knew it would be outrageous. We, we've all known that to do something like this, to say, 
Oh, someone gave me a wad of cash. Don't know who they were, but yeah, got it. Good on me. We've we've known you're not meant to do that, and yet the person who had previously in this house been the Attorney General of Australia and had charge for introducing the anti-corruption body is the and then never did it is the person who has set this up. And so I simply ask everybody when this comes to a vote to think of the way members have voted previously when they have taken their role on the Privileges Committee itself. Because on that committee they have always acted with integrity and responsibly and they have said they owe a duty to the parliament. Well, we all do. And this vote is a test of that. Because if this is allowed to stand, the register of members' interests is obliterated in terms of being a disclosure document. The concept that we find out what the conflicts of interests are for members of parliament is obliterated. The concept that we have mechanisms in place to avoid conflicts of interest and corruption is gone. That's the decision that's in front of this House now. Now, the Privileges Committee might come back with an answer I don't expect. That's on them. But it would be the cover-up to end all cover-ups if this House prevents the Privileges Committee from even being able to look at this resolution before us. If all they were allowed to look at was the letter that's been sent to them by the, by the shadow Attorney-General, without the authority of it being a resolution of the House, it means they deal with it differently. The only time the Privileges Committee has an obligation to report back is when the information gets to them by a resolution of this House. So everybody here at different points have made speeches about integrity. Everyone in this House has made speeches about standards. This resolution is a test of whether or not we hold to the exact words that on different occasions every one of us has uttered. Yeah. And uh, I think just, just, just before I call the Leader of the House, I think um, I need to just state the question. I'm presuming it, the question is that the motion move be disagreed to. The Leader of the House. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much. Mr Speaker, and uh, thank the honourable member for his contribution on what's uh, an important matter. I want to deal with uh, the practice uh, first, Mr Speaker, just to make very clear uh, the circumstances that, uh, that we're dealing with in relation to this particular issue. Uh, the first point is that uh, the uh, honourable member has, uh, for Watson, has asked uh, of you to uh, grant precedence, which of course he can do if he gives proper notice, and he has done that. We acknowledge that. And you have given it uh, due deliberation since uh, the early point that he raised that on Monday, and uh, we appreciate uh, that as well. And his request of you is, uh, uh, on my reading of the practice, Mr Speaker, uh, for you to give this issue precedence for the House to consider and to vote on, and that's what we're doing now. Uh, that's the extent of the request that's available to the member for Watson under the standing orders of the Speaker. Uh, so I want to make that very clear just to uh, respond to some of the points made in the member for Watson's contribution. The member for Watson hasn't asked the Speaker uh, to provide a verdict on the allegations that he has put forward to the Speaker as part of his submission. Uh, that is uh, abundant, abundantly clear and uh, that is uh, very important, Mr Speaker, to note as part of this. So uh, our position in relation uh, to this matter uh, is, uh, is on that basis. Um, at page 769 of practice, I think it's important to note, uh, and I quote in part, uh, the Speaker may reserve the matter for further consideration or may give the matter precedence and invite the member to move one or uh, one of the motions uh, referred to in an earlier paragraph uh, on page 679. It goes on to say, Mr Speaker, if I quote in part, if the matter gives, is given precedence, 
consideration and decision of every other question is suspended until the matter of privilege has been disposed of or until debate on any other motion related to the matter of privilege has been adjourned. At page 771, Mr Speaker, in the second paragraph, it says, and I quote, in determining that a prima facie case exists, the Speaker typically refers to the matter briefly, but does not express concluded views on the issues themselves, as it is for the House to decide. And I wanted to, to make that abundantly clear as part of my contribution uh, in explaining the government's position. What uh, this issue has done, Mr Speaker, is uh, alerted us, I think as a House, uh, to a much broader issue, uh, because there's not only uh, this matter in relation to uh, the former attorney that uh, has been raised by uh, the member opposite, but uh, there are a number of other cases, Mr Speaker, which are in a similar ilk. Now, I know that the member for Watson has made uh, a claim in relation to the trust uh, and to the lack of transparency on, uh, on his, uh, uh, on his uh, contribution during the course of uh, his earlier remarks, Mr Speaker. But, uh, the same principle applies to another, a number of other members uh, in this place over a period of time in relation to defamation trials in particular, which are expensive, and we note that, uh, particularly when a member of parliament uh, is taking a, an action against uh, a corporate entity or uh, a media organisation, a government uh, uh, body, uh, for example, and so these are difficult matters for members. Uh, well, I can give, uh, I can give the, the examples, and I, I intend to. Uh, for example, Mr Speaker, um, the same transparency issues raised by, uh, uh, by the member for Watson uh, arise in circumstances of GoFundMe pages mm. where there is no transparency about the donors, mm. no transparency whatsoever. Mm. You could make the same argument in relation to other members where they've received a donation, for example, from the Labor Party or indeed the Liberal Party if it's a reimbursement of costs or an indemnity of, of costs, because effectively that provides a flow-through vehicle. There's no transparency as to where that money has been donated from for the Labor Party then to donate that money onto the Member of Parliament. No, there's no transparency, Mr Speaker. There's no transparency in that process. And on the GoFundMe page, uh, where Senator Hanson Young, for example, uh, and it's a very interesting study, uh, or Senator Bob Brown, uh, or others, Mr Speaker, who have raised money, uh, in relation to Senator Hanson Young, which goes to exactly the points being made by the member for Watson about transparency in this issue. Uh, the donors to Senator Hanson Young on, uh, on a GoFundMe page included uh, Mr A. Non, N -O -N, or otherwise known as Anon. Uh, there was a John 51884010. There was a Mary W. There was an Anna B. There was a Buzz Rainbow Wolf. There was a Jeff CB. There was an Anne 559, a series of other numbers ending in 85. There was Xander B. There was MG. There was Steph Steph. There was Dave C. There was Bin H. There was Nikki. There was ET. ET donated. And Leanne W. Now, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I suggest to you that there is no transparency in that process. In fact, it makes a mockery of a suggestion that through the GoFundMe page that that is a transparent process Members on my left. that donors are properly identified in their contribution to a member of parliament to provide support to them in a defamation proceeding. That's the reality, Mr Speaker. And so the principle uh, espoused by the member for Watson is not as virtuous as he might make out. So there is, Mr Speaker, so I can go to the member for Hunter. Uh, who has uh, an issue in relation to this, but I don't intend uh, Leader of the Opposition because I, I appreciate the spirit in which uh, the Opposition member has approached this matter. I don't, I don't intend to conduct character assessments of those opposite because I, the point I'm making here is that I think this gives rise to a much bigger issue, a much bigger issue in relation to members of parliament. And that is why on Monday of this week, Mr Speaker, I wrote to the Chair of the Privileges uh, committee, and I understand that the Shadow Attorney General has also written to that committee uh, because I believe that there are further issues beyond this which need to be considered by the Privileges Committee. And I'm happy to, uh, in, in a moment, table uh, that letter that I 
wrote to uh, the Privileges Committee, uh, to, uh, to Mr Broadbent, and uh, I will make sure, Mr Speaker, um, that members are able to view that, because I think, and I've detailed this in my letter, that there are bigger considerations and further considerations than those raised in the motion before the House at the moment that should be considered uh, by uh, the Privileges Committee. And that should come back uh, to the government uh, to, uh, as appropriate from the committee, as they see appropriate from the committee, um, <coughs> to deal with uh, what is a much more significant issue. And I think there are other steps that, frankly, uh, should be contemplated between the government and the opposition in relation to what is a significant issue, because as uh, the member for Watson pointed out, there are many people who come into this parliament with significant wealth on both sides of the parliament. And good luck to them, as uh, the member for Watson pointed out. There are many members, as I look around, who don't have those deep pockets mm. to defend a defamation yeah. trial, in some cases costing over a million dollars. That's the reality. If the not Leader, members Leader, have... Leader Haskett just paused. Just for those members interjecting, I, I will eject members interjecting under 94A. This is not a normal procedure where you feel you can make contributions against the standing orders. This is a rare matter, and I need to hear people in silence. The Leader of the House. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, so I think there is a sensible discussion to be had uh, at the appropriate time uh, between the government and the opposition to see what, uh, uh, what the appropriate next step might be for uh, this parliament. I think it's a workplace uh, entitlement issue, and I think it's a broader discussion uh, that should be had, and uh, we are, as a government, prepared to have that discussion. So, Mr Speaker, I table uh, the letter that uh, I have uh, on the 18th of October written to uh, the Privileges Committee, uh, and for the reasons I've detailed uh, uh, today, Mr Speaker, um, the government is not going to support uh, the motion that's before the House because uh, I believe that the letter that I'm writing, uh, the letter that, the, uh, that has been written by uh, the Shadow Attorney-General, uh, and, the broad, and, and the broader issue, as I point out, uh, that he is here before us to deal with, um, uh, makes redundant the motion that's been moved by the member for Watson. Uh, and it's on that basis, Mr Speaker, that uh, the government will be opposing it. Here, here. The question is that the motion moved by the manager of opposition business be disagreed to, and I call the honourable the leader of the opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, I rise to defend the existence of the Register of Pecuniary Interests, and I rise to defend this Parliament, this House of Representatives, and the integrity of this House, because uh, I find it, quite frankly, extraordinary that the government uh, would be in a position of rejecting a recommendation uh, from uh, from the Speaker in granting precedence, as you have. Uh, I've been in the position of the Leader of the House and held that position for two terms of the Parliament. On no occasion would I have even considered uh, rejecting a motion that was brought forward after the Speaker had given due consideration to whether precedence uh, should, be should be given. Uh, as far as I'm aware, and I'd be interested in uh, the Leader of the House commenting about whether there was a time uh, since Federation whereby we have the circumstances that the Leader of the House is contemplating this parliament will, uh, will conduct. Because since Federation, uh, there has, I received advice, that there has never been a time where the House has voted down a resolution after precedence was given. In more than 120 years, that has never occurred. Why? Because the standing orders are very clear. The standing orders under 51D Part 1 say in order to grant precedence, uh, you had to give consideration as to whether, and I quote the standing order, a prima facie case of contempt or breach of privilege has been made out. And you can only consider that after you consider uh, number two, which is the matter has been raised at the earliest opportunity. Mr Speaker, you've given consideration to this, and there's been some commentary in recent times about 
uh, the seriousness in which you take your job. And uh, I've said publicly uh, that you are an outstanding speaker who has raised the conduct of this House and that that's in all of our interests, but it particularly assists the government to have a speaker who does their job independently. The idea here that, uh, that there is any doubt as to the facts are extraordinary. But what this motion from the member for Watson does is just ask that the committee consider those facts, consider them and make a determination and a recommendation. It's not a conclusion. And what, in opposing this motion, the government is saying, don't even look at it. Just pretend, look away as to something that is very serious. What we have here is that on June 1, the member for Pearce said that he would withdraw a defamation case against the ABC. On September 13, the member for Pearce updated his register addressing payments related to the defamation case. And it discloses part contribution of the payment of my fees by a blind trust known as the Legal Services Trust. As a potential beneficiary, I have no access to information about the conduct and finding of the trust, funding of the trust. But it's not a blind trust. He knows where the money's being invested. It's being invested in him, in what's a private legal matter. That's what a blind trust is. That's what the member for Wentworth, that when he was in this parliament and former prime minister did, so that investments could be made on his behalf and they wouldn't know where it was being invested. It's being paid to his lawyers for a private legal matter. And it is a nonsense that the member for Pearce has no idea who donated to this trust, because how did they know where to put the money? How did they know? Um, the GoFundMe page, the reference that uh, the minister referred to, GoFundMe pages, uh, people know they're public by def definition on the, uh, the internet. This, you had to know exactly how to donate money to this trust uh, to benefit uh, the member for Pearce. But the House doesn't know where the donations came from. The Australian public don't know where the money came from. And this cannot be allowed to stand. If it's allowed to stand, it renders redundant the processes uh, of this parliament whereby all of us cannot receive money from private interests for personal reasons without disclosing it. That's the basis of, that's sort of point one in stamping out corruption in this parliament. Now, I make no assertion as to uh, the, the, the member for Pearson, nor does, nor does this resolution. But if, if, if this resolution is not carried, then anyone can receive money from unknown sources into a so-called blind trust and never declare it. It renders all the things, including foreign donations and interference, don't ever yeah, don't come in here and talk about national security again if you, if you don't vote for this resolution, because you won't be taken seriously. Because this, this opens it all up to foreign interference in our politics. It opens it all up for corporate interests or individual interests to buy influence in this parliament without anyone knowing. And at the moment, some people can try to buy influence, and uh, we know that that gets disclosed, and people have lost their seats over those issues. Um, we know that uh, Senator Dastyari lost his seat in the Senate, in the Senate, as a result of a small amount. This is up to one million dollars for the former first legal officer of the land, the Attorney-General, who, who was responsible under, while he held that title, for introducing legislation to create a National Integrity Commission in this parliament. Like, you couldn't make this up. You could not make this scenario up whereby the government is going to vote against 
this. And I, I would say to the Leader of the House, uh, who, uh, in, in spite of it, at the risk of receiving substantial criticism on social media, I have some regard for. Think about what you are doing with this resolution, because you are saying, uh, notwithstanding the, the Speaker's ruling, uh, you, you are saying that you're ignoring the fact that the Speaker has determined there's a prima facie case worthy of consideration. You're not preempting the deliberations of the Privileges Committee. You're saying that they can't even look at it in spite of uh, the Speaker's determination in spite of the fact that there is so much public anger about this. And the public out there think, I think wrongly, that there is uh, a lot more uh, dodgy activity uh, than there is. I think most people go into parliament overwhelmingly on all sides out of the public interest. And, and that's why they do it. But we have to acknowledge that one of the reasons why I support a National Anti-Corruption Commission with teeth is that a whole lot of the public are really angry about these issues. And this will make them damn angry. And they have every right to be damn angry if this parliament is saying someone who was the first law officer of the land received donations of up to $1 million that he must know where they're from, but it, we, no one else has a right to know where they're from, and we won't even give consideration that, that that's OK. It's not OK. It's not OK. No one made the member for Pearce engage in this legal activity against the ABC. That was his decision. His decision. And he's entitled, I, I guess, uh, under, the, under the rules of the parliament uh, to seek donations, but he's not entitled to do it anonymously. He's not entitled to pretend that it is a blind trust uh, when it is not. There is an absolute responsibility of every member of this House to support this motion to re refer the member for peers to the Committee of Privileges it's consistent with every single decision that's been made in this House since Federation. Don't the set a new precedent which opens us up to corruption in concluded. 2021. So the question is that the motion moved by the Manager of Opposition Business be disagreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. No, Division required. Yes. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. Order the question is the motion moved by the manager of opposition business be disagreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Nichols and Gray, tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Werriwa and Lawler, tell us for the noes. Order. The result of the division is ayes 52, noes 49. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative.
The Minister is seeking the call. I am, Mr Speaker. The member for Isaacs just accused exiting ministers of taking a bribe. It is completely unacceptable. It is completely unparliamentary. And I ask the minister to do the right shadow minister to approach the dispatch box and withdraw that. Well, I'll, I'll just say to the minister, if members can just control themselves for a second, I'm the arbiter of who comes to the dispatch box and who doesn't. I heard interjections, but I didn't hear the substance of them. That's what happens when members uh, shout at each other uh, as they're leaving the chamber. The manager of opposition business on the point of order. On the point of order. What the House has just done is unprecedented. Mm. Right no, no, now, the no, House the has resolved— The manager of opposition business, no, we're not going to go over— No, because it, to exactly what he's just pointed to. No, he he does, just it, voted that we'll never find out if the someone's The manager bribed. of opposition business That's will resume his seat. The manager of opposition business will resume his seat. The, the, mem the member for McKellar, the manager of opposition business will resume his seat. The member for McKellar will not stand at the back of the chamber and interject. No, and you will not scoff. You've got a seat. Either sit in it or leave. I'm just going to ask the. Uh, member for Isaacs to come to the dispatch box and ask whether he made an unparliamentary remark or reflected on members. The member for Isaacs. Uh, I did, Speaker. Well, I need the member for Isaacs to withdraw. And I withdraw. I thank the member for Isaacs. I have received advice from the Chief Government Whip nominating members to be members of certain committees. The Minister. I ask Leave of the House to move a motion for the appointment of members of certain committees. Is leave granted? The Manager of Opposition Business. Sir, can we have a copy of the list? I want to know what I'm granting leave to. We haven't got it, so we're not voting for it. Well, we're not voting for it unless you tell us what it is. Well, there's two, there's two things. There's one where the leave is granted. Leave. And Great. the other, well, the other is the question is put at the end. So normally the practice is—I mean, I know tempers are a bit fried—but normally leave is granted, and then the minister has to move. Uh, yep. Sorry, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate what normally happens. Yep. We've just had something happen that has never happened in the history of federation that goes to a corruption issue. What normally happens? Well, is we not won't. The issue we won't today. keep debating the matter. Leave is either granted or it's not. All right, leave is not granted. I now call the member for Mallee.